Good morning and welcome to the Witte Museum's 2020 Conference on Texas Resilience Past, Present and Future panel discussion. My name is Michael Molak and I will be moderating a conversation with Dr. William Bush and Mrs. Tally Dodge. Dr. Bush serves as a professor of philosophy and history at Texas A&M San Antonio and is an author including a book entitled Circuit Writers for Mental Health. Mrs. Dolge is the Chief Executive Officer of Jewish Family Service of San Antonio. Both speakers are natives of New York. Dr. Bush, Mrs. Dolge, a warm welcome to you both. To begin, Dr. Bush, what inspired you to write a book about the evolution of the treatment of mental illness in Texas? Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Tally, and uh, thank you to the Witte Museum for uh, uh, facilitating this panel. Um, there are a lot of reasons uh, why I was inspired to write this book, but if I had to boil it down to just a couple, um, mental health is obviously an important and continually relevant topic. Uh, while we've made strides over the past century uh, uh, in identifying, treating, and supporting people with mental illness, uh, we still have a long way to go. And uh, I was curious about that history. Uh, because of, of current events uh, at the time that I started the book. Uh, the emergence of uh, mass shooting events uh, that often had some connection to mental illness uh, and teen suicides and things like that, uh, where uh, individuals in the press would sort of react to this, you know, by complaining that, you know, uh, we really hadn't made much progress in dealing with mental health and mental illness, and I was kind of curious about whether that was true. Uh, the second reason is that the, the topic related to my, my other research interests in the history of children and youth, uh, and in my research for my first book, which was on uh, race and juvenile justice in Texas history, I actually ended up using the Hogg Foundation's archives uh, and that sparked some curiosity about the history of, of mental health. Well, very good. And going back in time, what was the state doing to treat mental illness in the early 20th century when San Antonio was the largest city in Texas? Sure. Um, I'm going to begin with this image here. Uh, this is the Texas State Lunatic Asylum, uh, which was opened in 1861 uh, and was the first uh, mental hospital uh, in the state of Texas and was, was indicative of kind of the national uh, trend towards these sort of large institutions in the 19th century. Um, until about the 1970s, the average person in Texas, uh, as well as most other parts of the United States, uh, couldn't access mental health services outside of a setting like this, uh, like what you see in this image, uh, a hospital setting. Uh, up until about the 1960s and 70s, the state operated a complex of mental hospitals that were often described as prison-like. Uh, in fact, one of them was a former <laughs> jail, um, uh, around, dispersed around most of the regions of Texas with the exception of the Rio Grande Valley. Um, uh, and, and so as, as a result, uh, the, the name of that hospital suggested uh, how people thought about mental health and mental illness. So the wor words like lunatic and insane and madness and incurable, uh, those were the kinds of words that people associated with mental health and mental illness. And even experts used words like that that we wouldn't use today. Uh, uh, and mental health and mental illness were topics that were really kind of taboo in polite society. You just didn't talk about them, right? Uh, if you had a loved one or a family member, you kind of very quietly and privately uh, took them somewhere uh, to be dealt with uh, or to be treated. Uh, and that was, that was the attitude up through the early to mid 20th century. That attitude has changed over time. Uh, thanks to a massive and still ongoing uh, educational effort, which is a big part of what I wrote about uh, in my book. Um, 
before the 1940s, the average Texan would have accessed mental health services uh, not only through a hospital, but through a criminal court proceeding. Uh, because the only way to even access a hospital was to be committed through a jury trial, a criminal jury trial, uh, up until the 1950s. Uh, all of that, of course, has changed. Uh, and so my book really tells the story of how all of that changed in the 20th century. Um, today, there are many, many public and private organizations that offer formal mental health services, most colleges and universities offer degree programs uh, for people who want to work in the fields of mental health and mental illness. And mental health awareness uh, has permeated into many professions and vocations, just to take two examples, the military and the K-12 education system. Most people have at least some basic understanding uh, of mental health, whereas before, very few did. And so my book talks about uh, a movement, uh, a movement towards mental hygiene and mental health in the early to mid 20th century, and then how that movement came to Texas. And what you see here on the left uh, is a best-selling book uh, that was published in 1909 by a man named Clifford Beers, who was a former mental hospital patient or in 21st century language, a consumer of mental health services or a survivor of mental illness uh, who uh, decried the use of mental hospitals uh, and argued that most people who had experienced some form of trauma or mental illness could be treated and could continue to live in the community uh, and in society with the appropriate supports. And uh, Beers ends up becoming one of the founders of a movement called the National Committee for Mental Hygiene and really the beginning of the mental health movement in the early 20th century. That movement uh, uh, really uh, is sort of uh, supercharged, if you will, by the experience of World War II uh, and the experience of returning veterans and of psychologists and psychiatrists who treated uh, service members uh, uh, in combat and then when they returned home. And you begin to see these ideas permeate into popular culture after World War II. Uh, and so here on the right, you see uh, uh, a movie poster for the film, The Best Years of Our Lives, which won the Oscar for Best Picture in 1946 in which depicts the story of three returning uh, military veterans and their struggles to readjust uh, to civilian life. You also have a series of exposés uh, in the news media that kind of uh, uh, populate into popular culture as well. So the best-selling book and then film The Snake Pit, which tells the story of a, a really horrific uh, mental hospital from the point of view of a, a patient uh, and then you have news exposés like what you see here on the right uh, that circulate uh, throughout society uh, after World War II. And there's really a movement to, to change uh, the over-reliance on mental hospitals. Well, that is fascinating. Um, in your book, a major protagonist is I'm a hog. Can you share a little bit about her background and how it led to her role in leading other volunteers and philanthropists in transforming our approach to mental wellness? Absolutely. And so Ima Hogg, or Miss Ima, as she was known to her many admirers, uh, herself had a lot of firsthand experiences uh, from a pretty early age. And so here in the lower right, you see a photograph of uh, Ima, and that's her, the little girl in the middle of the picture. It's kind of a, a grainy picture. I apologize for that. Believe me, it's been touched up extensively to even make it this viewable. Um, but uh, this is her in her father's office, and that's her father, James Hogg, on the uh, left, sitting at the desk. And this is actually from when he was serving as attorney general, uh, so before he was elected governor uh, in 1890. Uh, and uh, uh, as a child, uh, she toured uh, the Austin State Hospital uh, with her father, uh, and she met children uh, who were there uh, and wrote letters uh, with these children and corresponded with them and really came, uh, would, would reflect later that she really came to empathize with them. 
Um, she had her own experiences with trauma. She lost her mother uh, to tuberculosis at a very young age. And then her father had a heart attack when she was a young adult. Um, during World War II, she had a nervous breakdown, or World War I, excuse me, she had a nervous breakdown. Uh, and what she found was that when she wanted to seek out treatment uh, around uh, the early 1920s, uh, there really wasn't uh, any place she could go in Texas. So she had to leave the state. Uh, at that time, there weren't really a lot of academic programs. There weren't a lot of outpatient services. And so she left the state and she ended up going to the Northeast. Uh, she was treated in Philadelphia and then later in Massachusetts. And while she was in Massachusetts, she met some of the leading figures in the mental health movement. Uh, and she was uh, heavily influenced by that experience. She came back to Texas uh, determined to bring mental health services to Texas. And so in 1929, she helped found uh, the second child guidance clinic in the state in Houston. Uh, and then uh, about a decade later, uh, she helped to found the Hogg Foundation for Mental Hygiene, as it was known then, uh, with a two and a half million dollar uh, bequest from her brother Will from the family's uh, uh, fortune that had been made largely in oil. Um, and she founded a foundation at the University of Texas. So it's a private nonprofit philanthropy, but it's housed at a public university and it's devoted to a single issue mental health, making it pretty unique. And in the book, I talk about some of the logistical and political challenges that she had to deal with um, in dealing with uh, elected officials and the Board of Regents and various uh, higher education officials to get the foundation established and to maintain its focus on mental health. What you see in the upper left here is a photograph of Ima uh, with the founding director uh, of the, the foundation, Robert Sutherland, uh, who was recruited uh, in 1940 and 41 by the then UT president, Homer Price Rainey, uh, who had worked with Sutherland uh, uh, in Washington uh, at a uh, nonprofit called the American Youth Commission, which was sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, which did a series of, of investigations of uh, the mental health impacts of racial segregation and discrimination on African-American children. Um, so Sutherland comes to Texas in 1941. Uh, he was a sociologist by training uh, and he takes over the foundation. Uh, he would be the director for 30 years. And during that time, the state of Texas would begin to develop some of the first academic programs uh, that would train a whole, you know, generations of, of psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers uh, and paraprofessionals uh, to work in mental health. Uh, they would be instrumental in the writing of the state's first mental health code, uh, which was adopted in 1957 and which uh, decriminalized uh, commitment to a state hospital, which set forth the state's first standards for uh, admissions, uh, release, and treatment of people with mental illness. Um, they would do a lot to ramp up public funding uh, of mental health services. In 1964 to 65, the state would uh, adopt uh, uh, the MHMR uh, system, uh, and you would begin to see funding for community mental health clinics all over the state. Most of them uh, community mental health clinics that you see today uh, that have been around for more than 10 or 20 years can trace their roots back to the movements of the 1950s and 60s that are described in the book. The other thing that's important that they did is that they helped to really develop the uh, and coordinate the development of uh, philanthropy uh, in Texas and in the Southwest region. And uh, there's a whole chapter in the book where I talk about that. Uh, so uh, they, they really had a huge impact uh, on the state. Well, it certainly seems so. Um, 
Mrs. Dodge, going to you, your organization has been providing counseling services in San Antonio for 46 years. How has JFS evolved in that time? Well, thank you so much uh, to the witty and to Mike and, you know, Bill. Bill, everything that you're saying really resonates um, with our organization and really seeing the movement of mental health in such a great way. So JFS has been around for 46 years and we've been providing services, mental health services, social services and senior services to the greater San Antonio population. A lot of people think Jewish Family Service, they think it's it's just a Jewish organization. 92% of our clientele are not Jewish and over 80% are eco economically um, it, uh, they they have economic issues. So we actually provide um, all of our services on a sliding scale fee. Um, anyone can receive our mental health services regardless of age, race, economic status, anything. We will take you um, and we actually have people right now, especially during this period of time with COVID, um, that we are seeing for $5 a session. So it, it, it is actually remarkable to see um, our organization really stepping up after so many years and looking at the future and what people need. And what people are needing right now is mental health care. Um, I will say that in the last 46 years, we have evolved because we have really watched what the San Antonio population needs. We also have expanded our services from the north side of town into the south side of town. We have established brand new programs and today I'm really proud to talk to you about um, a collaborative, the largest collaborative in the city, which is called the San Antonio Mobile Mental Wellness Collaborative. Um, we are six organizations bringing our community mental health services directly into the schools. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think that Bill touched on it a bit, but understanding the fact that mental health services has, has not been a priority as much in the school systems. And we have really relied on our incredible staff at schools from our administration to our teachers to our counselors way too much. And we, we really um, put them in, in a situation where they're not only teachers, they're also counselors that they're mental health professionals. And they're not that, they're not trained in that. So what we did as a collaborative was brought um, these services, all of our services into the schools by providing licensed mental health counselors to provide not only counseling, but group counseling, education, trainings for teachers, administrators. Um, this year, we were fortunate enough to pilot the program at South San Antonio ISD. And I wanna tell you that this was all brought about because of a movement of an incredible group of students. So um, a group of students actually realized the need for mental health services in their school district. And they went to their school board and said, how do you expect us to succeed in school when we don't have the mental health services that we need? And the school district listened. They heard, they didn't know exactly what to do. And this program was developed, um, thank goodness, um, I had some idea because I actually am a mental health advocate and speaker all over the city. Um, and I talk about my own mental health issues as a child. And I would have never dreamed of a program like this, this comprehensive with this many offerings that a school district would have. And I would have wanted this in my teenage years when I was actually going through my own mental health challenges. So um, I will tell you it is Jewish Family Service, Rise Recovery, Communities in Schools, Children's Bereavement Center, Family Service Association, um, and yep, and, and us. So it's really um, an incredible collaborative. And I will tell you that um, it is receiving not just attention from other school districts, which I'll tell you, we are we are going into two other school districts we, um, in this year, but we also have nine additional school districts interested in this program. 
And then we, we now have received national attention um, through a wonderful documentary that was done with Congressman uh, Will Hurd um, on the need for mental health in the schools. So uh, I, I will say that this has been one of the most remarkable experiences because we, we thought we were going to see only around 150 to 300 community members in the South Sand community in our first year. And we have received over 1,500 people um, who have received our services over this first, actually it was only eight months because it was all during this time. And we will tell you, um, I will talk to you a little bit about how we've pivoted and about how we're continuing to pivot into the next school year um, by continuing to offer our services no matter what um, virtually. And we have actually developed a curriculum for trainings for teachers and administrators during this period of time and, and really working with the mental health as well as the education of a student. So thank you. Well, thank you, Tally, and congratulations to you and your partner agencies for really bringing these vital services to the kids that need it, that logistically would not be able to seek out uh, these services and and these agencies that can really just come together and do what they do well uh, in addressing the challenges that, that high school students face. Um, to, I was just going to ask either one or both of you, in the general population, what percentage suffers from some form of mental uh, challenge such as depression, anxiety, or addiction? Right now, um, the numbers are, are really staggering. Um, it's, it's really one in five. Um, and I actually think it's probably more than that. And so if you're going to really think about the amount of people, and I love Bill's um, take on this, in my, in my opinion, it must be closer to one in three. Because what happens is we are affected by the people around us. And so if you may personally not be suffering from depression, anxiety, or some form of mental health illness, However, if somebody around you is, you receive that stress, if it's a loved one. Um, so everyone, I believe, is affected in some way by mental illness. And we really have to start this conversation and continue the movement of understanding that mental wellness is as important as physical wellness. Dr. Bush, anything to add? Yeah, to that? yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I completely agree. As you were, uh, as you were saying that, I was thinking of the opening vignette in my book, which is, uh, the story of this, uh, 17 year old girl from San Antonio, uh, who walked into a police station and committed suicide. Uh, uh essentially she came in with a knife, uh, got into a scuffle with two police officers and they shot her and, uh, they found a suicide note. Uh, later, in which she uh, lamented the state of her mental health, and uh, 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 in, at the beginning of the book, I then presented some statistics that were very similar to what Tally was just talking about, about the not only the prevalence of uh, uh, people who are either reported or unreported mental illness, but the, the low numbers of people who are able to get the services that they need. Right. So it's not just about diagnosed or undiagnosed. It's also about whether you're receiving help and uh, too many people. And this has been a trend for, you know, decades, even despite all of the, the good reforms that have happened. Too many people end up getting treated through the criminal justice system. Right. Or through uh, other avenues uh, by people who may have no training. Uh, as Tally was alluding to in the school system, no formal training or just, you know, a little bit of training, but not really enough to really be able to function in that role. Um, so it, it's a huge problem, despite the fact that we, we are more kind of aware and literate about mental health than we were, you know, generations ago. Uh, so it's definitely still a problem. And even at the time that I was writing, this was years before COVID, which has really probably amped all of those numbers up uh, to some uh, as yet unknown level. 
And, and Bill, 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 you're exactly correct. It has. Um, we are seeing such large, so, so many larger numbers in suicide rates and in depression and anxiety right now. Um, I will tell you that these programs and services that continue to sort of do the outreach in the communities as opposed to having them come to, to us, it's, it's still about transportation issues. I think many people don't realize that um, that many people don't have ways to to get to some of these services. Even if we provide these services for a very minimal amount, it still could take a day for somebody to get there. So one of the reasons why our program was established was because we want to go into the community and be able to offer them access to where where they are, as opposed to having them come to us. And I think that actually um, more services in this city um, are needed in that way that they are doing outreach, that they're becoming mobile, um, as opposed to saying, you need to come to us in order to receive those services. And I think at this time, because of COVID and the reach that we have through, uh, through technology for good or for bad, it is giving a certain percentage of the population an understanding that they can get services regardless of where they are. Um, we are finding even in our impoverished areas that we're able to get to them, if not by by telehealth, but by telephone even. So that I mean, it's not as personal. It's not doing the same thing. I'm never going to replace inpatient. I think we need this human connection more than anything. But I also think at the same time, we are providing a, a, a more expansive service to more people um, in the community. If, if I can piggyback on that a little bit. Um, so the title of my book is Circuit Riders for Mental Health, uh, and that title comes from uh, something that the, the Hogg Foundation staff uh, adopted as their own sort of nickname for what they were doing, because for the first 10 to 15 years of their existence, all of these uh, academics and advocates were just driving all over the state, uh, giving talks on mental health, uh, thousands and thousands of them. Um, in small towns and metropolitan areas as well, in schools and churches and community centers. Um, they were advising city governments and municipal governments on developing services. Um, but this whole theme that I think resonates with what, what Tally's describing in this really great mobile project is this idea that you have to go to the people that you're trying to help. You have to meet people where they are, quite <laughs> literally. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I see that kind of continuing. Uh, and then the other thing I think they were very innovative about that I also see kind of happening now somewhat out of necessity because of COVID is the, the innovative use of mass communication uh, to reach people, to uh, uh, get information to people, to educate people, to make people aware that services exist. Um, and it is still sometimes shocking to find that, <laughs> you know, that services, uh, that people aren't aware of services uh, that might be in their own backyard. Um, so. Well, it sounds like you all are, are optimistic. I've, I've been struck by the fact that on average, there's one counselor per 800 students in our high school uh, when we're talking about one in five and perhaps more uh, suffering from some uh, form of, of mental health challenge. Uh, do you, you think we're moving in the right direction? It sounds like you do. Tally? Um, yes, I mean, I feel that for school districts to see a program like what we're doing as a viable program to be bringing into school districts, this is monumental. I think for a long time, we skirted over the issue of mental wellness and mental health. Um, people don't want to talk about something that they don't understand, that they can't tangibly see. Um, you can't see when a person is suffering on the, on the inside. So um, it is amazing to me that all of these school districts are understanding that a program like this could impact them so positively in their entire community, that it wouldn't just affect the student, but it would affect the teachers, the administration, the families. 
Um, and they would understand that, that ultimately what that would lead to are better numbers in the schools. It would lead to less dropout rate. It would lead to um, a, a number of positive uh, emotionally and physically uh, develop, great developments. So I, I, I really think, yes, we have a long way to go, Mike. I really absolutely think we have a very long way to go. But this is just a step in the right direction. If people are listening and hearing the need and understanding that one in five or one in four or one in three are affected by mental illness and you will, all, every single one of us, 100% of us will be affected in some way by a mental health challenge in our life. And if we need to, we need to understand that, be aware of that and continue to educate on that, educate the entire population. And I think that's what Bill's doing. And I love the fact that he's bringing the history of it into the present. Yeah, if well, I can add something to that. Um, uh, thank you, by the way, for that. Um, and, and, you know, for what you're doing, it's, you know, invaluable. Um, you know, one of the interesting uh, uh, conversations that's kind of happened this summer as a result of our national conversation about policing uh, is this question about uh, when it's appropriate to respond to a situation with law enforcement and when it's appropriate to respond to a situation with uh, counseling, right, or mental health services, for example. Uh, and I think the school is a, you know, a, a, a key setting for that conversation because, of course, in the last 25 years, we've seen the advent of uh, police in schools uh, as school resource officers often being made to perform mental health services that they really haven't been trained to provide. It's not really their fault, right? But they end up uh, as individuals finding themselves. So there have been a lot of studies. Uh, about it. Every spring uh, here at AM, I teach a class called uh, Childhood in America. And uh, last year, uh, this past spring, uh, our students uh, read a book, uh, it was a sociological study called Homeroom Security, which was about school discipline policies uh, more broadly, uh, including the use of school resource officers. But a key uh, uh, thesis of that book was that we've become so focused on discipline and order in the schools that we we're not really responding to the actual needs of the kids. We're responding to problems that we see, but not the actual problems uh, uh, in many cases. Uh, and uh, uh, it seems to me, you know, uh, uh, what, what Tally is, is in the mobile clinic are attempting to accomplish, of course, you would like to see that regularized in the schools and be embedded in their budgets so that there is not a need to bring in these, you know, outside services. Uh, uh, the, the demonstration model approach is really important, but the goal of a demonstration model is that it will lead to something more permanent and lasting. Uh, and, and so that's really important, I think, in, in all these conversations about mental health, whether it's in a school setting or out just on the streets uh, of our cities, um, uh, that, we're, that we're responding appropriately to, to the needs of our fellow citizens. Well, that's a great point and very timely, Dr. Bush. Um, and, you know, we have made a lot of progress in our understanding of, of mental health and mental wellness. And we've talked about the past and present of mental health. What can each of us be doing to be more resilient and proactive in promoting uh, our mental health and, and supporting others in theirs? Well, I think, Mike, first of all, talking about it, um, destigmatizing mental health and mental health care, really understanding that we all have a piece of this, like I keep saying, but also education. Education is a huge component of this. A lot of people don't understand what it's like to get mental health services. So before somebody goes and, and goes and, and sits down with a counselor, what is it like? Wh why do I need to talk about my mental health? What are the resources that are out there? What can I provide my family? So I think a lot of the pieces have to do with a psychoeducational approach before we get into the counseling itself. I. 
I, everybody wants this to be something that everybody um, is doing. Everybody would love, to, everybody in the mental health field would love to see everybody having, being okay and destigmatizing therapy and everything like that. But our first step to doing that is really helping people to understand what it is. Um, why our body reacts to certain things that our, our mind does. There, there's a lot of pieces that we should get to so people can be comfortable with understanding that. Like we don't, um, when we go to a doctor's office, we're not needing to know the intricacies. We understand that this is about our health and about getting an annual checkup. Why is it that we're not doing that same thing for our mental health? Um, as, as soon as your mental health deteriorates, your body will deteriorate as well. You won't be able to take care of your body. So be, making that one in the same and that conversation is, is probably the first step. And I think we're doing that. And I will say, as, as much as I have a love-hate relationship with the internet, I think that they are bringing um, something very important to, to, uh, to mental health. Uh, they're bringing an advocacy. They're bringing a, this is me. A lot of people are telling their stories. A lot of people are not ashamed anymore. There's a vulnerability. And that's also a piece of, of this period of time and the beauty of, of this time with COVID in that we have to communicate in a different way. So there's been a different vulnerability. Um, so I think we're starting. We're starting the conversation. Yeah, yep. I, I would I, I would piggyback on that to say uh, uh, the the flip side of of talking about it is listening, and uh, I think the those of us that especially those of us that are in a position of with any kind of power or authority uh, uh, to really help make some kind of a change, we need to be willing to listen to people whose experiences are different from our own. And, uh, you know, to try to be introspective uh, about how we're reacting uh, to those those stories when we do hear them. Um, and then uh, I would say, uh, you know, understanding the, the sort of connectedness of mental health and mental illness with the sort of socioeconomic context, right? And this was something that the uh, Hogg Foundation kind of mental health reformers were really uh, good about in the 1940s and 50s was talking about how, uh, you know, inadequate water and sewage services could have mental health impacts, right? Or, uh, uh, you know, uh, substandard housing or schooling uh, that there could be mental health impacts of that. Uh, they published a research monograph series that started in the 1950s, and the first book was a study of disaster response to a wave of tornadoes in North Texas in the Waco area. And it was one of the first studies of disaster response and the mental health impacts of natural disasters uh, that had ever been published. Uh, and it's still considered kind of a foundational study in that what is now an entire field of study. Um, but again, that you know, taking this sort of broad approach uh, to talking about uh, mental health and mental illness. And again, I feel like the the things that have been going on in our society over the last several months between COVID uh, and the uh, the conversation about racial inequality that we're having right now. I think both of those things uh, are highly relevant uh, to mental health and mental illness and our conversations about uh, access to services or uh, compassion and recognition of people's struggles and uh, how we should appropriately respond as individuals and as, as a society. Um, so, uh, So I, I just would love to add a little piece to that. Um, I think one of the things we're not looking at is um, trauma during this period of time and racial trauma. Um, we are all in some ways, believe it or not, dealing with trauma because of what's going on with the COVID-19. Um, trauma is, can be something as bad as witnessing a murder or it can be as bad as, as, as just not having any idea what to do um, during this period of time. 
And so I think we really have to look at how we address trauma as well um, during this period of time and look at the, the places and the, the resources in the city. Um, we actually have all of our, all of my entire staff is trained and certified in trauma-informed care. And they, they know how to look and, and, and decipher, is this trauma or is this a mental illness? And I think one of the things is, is that trauma-informed care does, it does, there's no blaming. It's actually really a beautiful way. It's an exploratory way to see how a person is dealing uh, mentally with something. And so I, I would love to see a little bit more of that um, with, you know, within the San Antonio community is the trauma informed care and making that actually a mandatory thing. And that's one thing that we're doing with our school program as well that all of our um, participants and I mean all of our um, cl clinical participants are trauma informed. There are also reports of, of, that there's an epidemic of isolation in our society, surely exasperated by COVID and quarantining uh, and reports that isolation and loneliness can be as deadly as cigarettes and obesity. Um, what do you say to, to that we might do to address that, Tally or Dr. Bush? Um, I, I think actually it's one in the same. So um, what, what does isolation do? It may lead to do you doing some of these very negative habits. And I think that's what we don't realize is that they are one and the same. So we may have given up smoking 20 years ago, but all of a sudden we're under such severe stress and people are all of a sudden thinking of picking up a cigarette again, even though it's not supposed, even though we know logically that that is a negative behavior. So it's really understanding that the negative behaviors um, sometimes are influenced by the isolation. And we don't all have to be isolated during this period of time. There are other ways to connect. And I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do, even if it's virtually, even if it's on the phone, but how do we connect during this time? And that's that's actually a conversation I think it needs to be a broader conversation as we continue to see no real end to, to this epidemic um, is, is how are we going to, to communicate and how are we going to help the people who are isolated? Um, as you know, part of my, um, a part of our mission is to help um, our senior population and they are suffering tremendously with isolation right now. Um, a lot of people can't see their families and some of them don't know how to use this. So what do we do and what kind of services can we provide without putting anyone in jeopardy? And that's that's what we, we have to look at. And I don't have the answer for that. Um, we're doing the best job we can. We're doing outreach. We are doing things that are socially distant, but we also have people who are, um, their health and their physical health is compromised. And so then what does that do when their physical health is compromised, the isolation and, you know, the mental health, it's, it's, some somewhat of a perfect perfect storm. Dr. Bush, anything to add? Not really. Uh, uh, I you know, thinking about uh, historical precedents to this, you know, the Spanish flu outbreak uh, of 1918 and 19, and then the the uh, periodic surges of polio, uh, especially in the post-war era. Uh, you know, I, I really didn't find much of a mental health response to those in uh, uh, studying those. Uh, and my, my guess is there was not a massive uh, mobilization of mental health services at either one of those times. Uh, those were seen primarily as, as medical emergencies uh, in the sort of disease sense uh, and not really as mental health emergencies. There is quite a bit of, of uh, history of, of uh, mental health uh, advocates working on uh, uh, the challenges of senior citizens and isolation among senior citizens. Uh, but uh, uh, I really, you know, the insights that I've seen there really wouldn't add much to what Tally has already said uh, perfectly. <laughs> well, very well. Very well. Our 
you all optimistic about the 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 funding that the federal, state, and local governments are providing in support of the mental wellness initiatives? Tally. I was like, Bill, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, so again, I'm going to re refer back to the introduction of my, to my book. I, uh, Texas was in the bottom third or bottom quarter of funding for mental health services before the uh, uh, Sandy Hook uh, shooting. And uh, Texas, like a lot of other states and the federal government, responded to that, even though it didn't happen in Texas, uh, by ramping up their funding for mental health. But really what they were doing was backfilling cuts that had been made for the previous you know, 20 years or so. Um, you know, I, I would like to be optimistic, but I think, you know, we know that we're looking at some very difficult budget cycles uh, at the state level in the next uh, uh, probably two or three biennia uh, with the falling apart of the oil market. And uh, uh, I, I work in higher ed, so I can tell you that <laughs> we're having lots of conversations about the upcoming budget cycles uh, because we're expecting them to be very tough. And I would say at the federal level, you're going to see the same thing because of uh, what's happened with the economy as a result of COVID. Um, the question is, is it possible to mount a recovery strategy at the federal and the state level that incorporates mental health services in some way? And I, that's probably the big challenge for advocates uh, in the kind of advocacy community for mental health. Um, I, you know, I'm optimistic about the uh, the commitment of those advocates and of the the general community, and I think that my hope is that to a great extent, the experiences of these last several months are going to uh, increase demand amongst the public for those services. Uh, I think that's a key to getting policymakers to move: is that if the public demands it, that, that can have an impact. So I'll just, I mean, everything you said was absolutely correct. And um, I think this is a moment right now to understand mental health, but also to provide funding for mental health. And um, I will tell you that our program just received a wonderful federal grant for two years from HHSC. And so they they see the value in programs like this. But I, I will also say it is definitely going to be a challenge. This period of time is going to be a challenge in any funding arena, whether it's fundraising or it's, you know, just, you know, your normal everyday donors who really believe in this because of, of the economic impact of the pandemic. So we really have to be very, um, we have to work together. I mean, just like what our, what our program is, that nobody should own a piece of this, that all of us should really be passionate about understanding that like the mental wellness piece, because we won't be able to recover economically or physically from all of this if we don't have the third piece, which is the mental health piece. So it's working together with all organizations or all of the, the schools or all of the universities to come up with a plan that will be able to impact the greater city. Um, and I think that that hasn't been done. I think a lot of the, the time, a lot of us had, had worked in silos and understandably, but that this isn't the time for that. Um, we don't have the money for that and the outreach will be much larger if we work together. Well, very good. Well, um, Dr. Bush, the, uh, your book, Circuit Writers for Mental Health. Can we get a copy of that in the Witte Museum uh, gift shop today? I don't know the answer to that question, um, but you definitely can get it by visiting the Texas A&M University Press website. And uh, we should have a, a code available uh, when this airs that we can make available to viewers so that they can get a discount uh, if they wanna order it uh, from the A&M Press website. Well, we've, we've learned a lot and, and you've enticed uh, our uh, 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 imagination. So we'd like to get a copy of that. And Tally, any parting words for, for the audience? 
Um, I, I just want to continue to say, um, take care of your, your mental health the same way you take care of your physical health. And also, there are services out in the San Antonio community that do provide access to anyone in need. Um, JFS is one of them. You can go on jfs-sa.org and see all of our services. Um, we're also doing a lot of education in the community, the same thing, um, going out and speaking and talking about the pandemic and talking about stress. Um, but make this a priority and also make this a normalized conversation. Uh, as we talked about today, I think that Bill did an incredible job of just normalizing the fact that we all live with this and look at how far back. And I think I'm a hog did such an incredible job and was not afraid to stand up and tell her story. And really, you know, she, she was a pioneer. She was a pioneer for mental wellness. So um, that's what I would say. Get out there, tell your story. Well, thank you, Tally. Thank you, Dr. Bush. Uh, one day soon, hopefully, we'll be together in person and discussing these issues further. Thank you so much for participating in the Whitty Museum's 2020 Conference on Texas.